Yes, it could begin this way, right here, just like that, in a rather slow and ponderous way, in this neutral place that belongs to all and to none, where people pass by almost without seeing each other, where the life of the building regularly and distantly resounds. For all that passes, passes by the stairs, and all that comes, comes by the stairs. Letters, announcements of births, marriages and deaths, furniture brought in or taken out by removers, the doctor called in an emergency, the traveler returning from a long voyage. It's because of that that the staircase remains an anonymous, cold, and almost hostile place. Mm -hmm. These are my notes today for this review because my fucking phone was stolen. So I'm in Paris and I decided the best thing to do on a sunny Tuesday would be to walk through the Père Lachaise graveyard for my review of Georges Perec's Life, a User's Manual. As you can see, it's kind of just stunning and beautiful and very quiet and there's many famous people buried here. Oscar Wilde and Jim Morrison being a couple of them, Edith Piaf, um, and Georges himself. Uh, I'm in Paris because I was researching uh, another extremely rare book, which I'm uh, very excited to tell you about one day soon uh, at the Bibliothèque Nationale, but um, that is a secret for now, though you can kind of track the progress of this thing that I've been working on for a very long time on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and some of you will undoubtedly guess it, but uh, I'm sure all of you will appreciate it very much when it comes to light. So yeah, basically my iPhone was stolen on the Metro the other day, so I kind of put a dent in my plan, so I'm doing handwritten notes for the first time ever. And um, I think it's going to work better. I don't know who stole my iPhone exactly, but you know, Fuck him, fuck his mother, fuck his whole family. I hope he dies and is roasted on a spit in hell, but, uh, you know, clearly he, uh, he needed it more than me, and he was, he was very good at it. So, there you go. So I'll spoil the ending for you. It takes place entirely in one instant, a few moments before the death of this painter in this apartment building in Paris this fictional apartment building, you see what's going on is um, the entire novel is about the relationships of uh, the tenants of this building to this painter who is on the very last moments of life and uh, it's a fictional place, it doesn't actually exist but um, from the descriptions and the details and the uh, the imagination of Perak you would think it does, you know I mean, it's so, it's so perfectly constructed, this novel, which is more like a, you know, it's like a series of novels more than just one book, because it's all about the tenants and their families and the people that they've known and the previous tenants, if it's relevant in their loves and relationships and families and friends. And you never quite know where the novel is going to go. And the construction is so fascinating. It's. Um, after 500 pages, you feel like you could, you know, like you could construct this entire apartment building somewhere in a, Par in a Parisian neighborhood. Like, uh, you could construct it brick by brick. Every single detail. So, Parekh was a huge obsessive with, like, lists. He, like, he loved, he loved lists, and he loved systems and logic and mathematical concepts. And so, you know, when you have this book you have all of these uh, cold and calculated logical descriptions which make up in their context you know they bring out the poetic and human element which is incredible because it's like how do you bring out something uh, that is so alive from something is, that is so dead you know how does you know the the listing the recipe of the crab salad that this guy is obsessed with being known for you know how does that actually you know illuminate his character but it's incredible because it does you know m more so than so many other authors yeah, so things like recipes and then like tools and materials and these uh, these names and references and all of these 
these things you can you can see you can feel the obsessive quality and you can see the passion for, for these logical for again for systems and for systematic thought and thinking uh, and having that being utilized but it never becomes obnoxious the stories range from like the clever and the mundane to like you know the really incredibly grandiose and beautiful and uh, almost like you know this Borgesian quality I mean they're just absolutely mesmerizing stories um, from all all these different people it's like you just like cut off half of this apartment building and you were just looking in and seeing all these different <laughs> fucking things it's a fucking bee that has landed on my camera <laughs> I can't get rid of it it's ridiculous he's just chilling there this is ridiculous this is gonna end in a fatal fucking he's just like on the fucking on button this is nuts He's just chilling. Oh, now he's gone. He's probably gonna fly into my eyeball or something. There he goes. You bastard. He's just chilling. Just wanted to stop and say hello. Bonjour, monsieur. Au revoir. A bee. <laughs> A bee. Une abeille. Look at these graves. These are incredible. Like, which passage do I want to go down? Okay, let's go down this one, see what's going on. See if we can find Oscar Wilde. Ugh, he's buried in here somewhere. The entire structure of the book is based on the Knight's Tour of the Chessboard, which is based, it's kind of like this, uh, this um, I, I think it's like a mathematical problem or a conundrum where it's like, you know, the idea is to track the movement of a knight across a chessboard so that he only touches each square just once. Right? And this kind of structure of the novel comes from being involved, you know, with, uh, as many of you will know, with the Olipo movement, or the Olipo group, started by Raymond Quineau over here in, uh, here in Paris. And Olipo stands for the Ouvroir de Literature Potentielle, you know, which is the, you know, the kind of the workshop for potential literature. And I talked about this in my review of Boris Vian's uh, Foam of the Days, or Foam on the Daydream. But uh, the whole idea behind it is to discover new and interesting ways to write novels, to, to write, to create these stories, you know, reinventing the novel. And uh, in the case of Georges Perec, it is my opinion that he, he certainly did. Um, it's amazing. I've never read anything like it, ever. There is no other book like it that I'm aware of. Um, or, or as beautiful, you know. The Olipo thing was started actually by Raymond Quinault and a French uh, mathematician named uh, Francois Lyonnais, I think, or Lyonnais. Again, you know, the complexity of the novel, the, the, it's 500 pages, but the complexity makes it feel like it was, uh, you know, um, uh, like six different novels at least, or many, many more. Look at this. It's down here. Cool. This place is just labyrinthine. I'm never gonna get through all of it today. There's just so much. Anyways, you could take any one of these stories and have an incredibly magnificent film out of like you know three or three or four pages, um, easily. Uh, and I'll read you some at the end of this. I don't know where I'll read them, but uh, I will somewhere around here. And uh, and I have to find George too. He's somewhere. I think he's at the crematorium. I might have to take a left here, going up. But uh, all of the uh, the tenants in this building, you know, which whose stories you find out and are are privy to, are related you know, to this main character. That kind of like the vein, the through line for the narrative, for the. You know, this protagonist, um, Bartle Booth, who is a painter, who has decided that he is going to paint 500 different seaports in various cities around the world, and he is going to, he is going to change each of these 500 paintings into 
a jigsaw puzzle. He's going to cut them up, and then 20 years after they have been painted and created into jigsaw puzzles, he is going to dissolve them entirely, destroying his work one by one by one. And he fails. He, he fails, I think, on like number 439 or something. And failure in art or in life in general, failure and suicide is this constant thread of Georges Perec's novel. And uh, it is one of the consistent themes, although it's, it's, very, it's a very humorous book, but it's also kind of tragic and... It was like what uh, I think Amélie by Jean-Pierre Genet took a lot, a lot from the work of Georges Perec or uh, the Olipo movement. Georges Perec, Georges Perec wrote some incredible books and was recognized at least uh, in France for them by the end of his life, but um, the end of his life was very, very, uh, you know, almost criminally short, you know, it was, he died at the age of 45, and uh, that staircase that I'm walking down in the beginning, there's a little documentary in French about him where he's walking down that same staircase, the Rue, Rue Villain, I believe. And, uh, and this is just 15 minutes away from there. It's amazing to, uh, to wonder where you'll end up when you're dead. So, tried to find Georges, but uh, as you can see, there are quite a bit of these. There's actually a funeral going on right now over <laughs> to my left. But it's, uh, I'm trying, there's just so many. I've kind of failed at that. Should have gotten his number. They're all kind of listed, like a phone book. Damn. Oh well. Page 137, chapter 31, Beaumont 3. An inspector from Rethel was given the task of elucidating the events that had led to the double murder at chaumont Poissien. He took barely a week to complete his investigation and succeeded only in the deepening the mystery surrounding this murky business. It was established that the murderer had not broken into the Bridehell's bungalow, but had probably entered by the back door, which was almost never locked even at night, and that he had left in the same way, locking the door behind him. The murder weapon was a razor, or to be more precise, a scalpel with a replaceable blade, which the murderer no doubt had brought with him, and in any case had taken away, since there was no trace of it in the house, nor was there any fingerprints or any other clues. The crime had taken place in the night of this Sunday. The exact time could not be ascertained. Nobody had heard a thing. No shout, no noise. It was very probable that Francois and Elizabeth were killed in their sleep so quickly that they didn't have time to resist. The murderer slit their throats with such dexterity that one of the first police hypotheses was that the criminal must have been either a professional killer or a meat butcher or a surgeon. Obviously all these points proved that the crime had been carefully premeditated, but nobody at Chap at chaumont Procien or where else or anywhere else could imagine why anyone would have wanted to murder somebody like Francois Bridel or his wife. They had settled in the village a little more than a year before. It wasn't known exactly where they had come from, maybe from the south, but nobody knew for certain, and it seemed that before settling down they had led a rather nomadic life. The interrogations of the Bridal parents at Arlon and at Vera de Beaumont produced no new information. Like Madame de Beaumont, the Bridal parents had lost touch with their child many years earlier. Appeals for information with photographs of the two victims were posted widely in France and abroad, but they too led to nothing. For a few weeks, the public paid enthusiastic attention to this mystery, which was taken up by dozens of amateur migrants and journalists scraping around for a story. The double crime was turned into a far-flung twist of the bazooka affair, with some commentators claiming Bridell had been one of the Kovacs' strong-arm men. The story was mixed up with the FLN by some, with the, Ma the Main Rouge anarchists by others, and also with the right-wing Rexists and even with an obscure story of pretenders to the throne of France, since amongst Elizabeth's alleged ancestors there was a certain Sothen de Beaumont, who was none other than a legitimized bastard son of the Duke de Berry. Then, as the investigation began to peter out, the police and the gossip columnists, the armchair Holmeses and the inquisitive onlookers began to tire of the business. Without a shred of plausible evidence, the coroner's verdict was that the crime had been committed by a tramp or lunatic, such 
as are too, still too often to be found in suburban areas and on the outskirts of our villages. <clears throat> Outraged by a judgment which told her nothing of what she felt she had a right to know about her daughter's fate, Madame de Beaumont asked her lawyer, Léon Saligny, whose liking for criminal cases was well known to her, to reopen the investigation. For many months, Vera de Beaumont had no news at all from Saligny. From time to time, she received laconic postcards informing her that he had not given up hope and was pursuing his inquiries in Hamburg, Brussels, Marseille, Venice, etc. Finally, on the 7th of May, 1960, Salini came back to her. Everyone, he said, from the police on has grasped that the Bridells were murdered for something they did or for something that happened in the past, but up to now, no one has been able to uncover any clue at all which would direct their inquiries in one direction rather than another. The life of the Bridell couple seems to have been absolutely uneventful in spite of the itching feet they seem to have in their first year of their marriage. They met in June 1957 at Bagnol-sur-Sez and married six weeks later. He was working at Marcoul. She had recently been hired as a waitress in the restaurant where he took his evening meal. His life as a bachelor also left no gaps for mysteries. At Arlon, the small town where he had taken his leave from four years earlier, he was thought of as a good workman, a foreman in the making, potentially good enough to set up his own small business. To find work, he had to translate himself to Germany, to the Saar, actually, and then to Neuweiler and his small village near Saarbrücken. Then he went to Chateau d'Aix in Switzerland, from there to Marcoul, where he was working on a villa being built for one of the engineers at the reactor site. In none of these places did anything sufficiently serious happen to him that might motivate his murder five years later. Apparently, the only incident he was involved in was a brawl with soldiers after a dance. Things are completely different for Elizabeth. From the moment she left you in 1946 until her arrival in Bagnol, says in 1957, her life is a blank. A complete, unknown, blank, except for the fact that she introduced herself to the restaurant manager under the name of Elizabeth Lidenol. The official investigation established those facts anyways, and the police tried desperately to find out what Elizabeth might have been up to over those 11 years. They hunted through hundreds and hundreds of files, but they found nothing. So I reopened the investigation with nothing to go on. My working hypothesis, or more precisely my initial scenario, was this. Many years before her marriage, Elizabeth had committed some heinous fault and was forced to flee and hide. The fact that she had finally got married shows that she thought she was at least completely free of the man or woman whose vengeance she had reason to fear. But two years later, nonetheless, that vengeance strikes her down. Overall, my reasoning was coherent, but the gaps had to be filled in. I conjectured that if the problem were to be soluble, then the heinous fault must have at least had one extant trace. So I decided to comb systematically all of the daily newspapers from 46 to 1957. It's a tiresome task, but in no sense an impossible one. I hired five students to work at the Bibliothèque Nationale, listing all the art articles and fillers dealing explicitly or implicitly with a woman between 15 and 30 years of age. For every news story that fitted this criterion, I conducted further investigations. Thus, I examined several hundred cases corresponding to stage one of my scenario. For example, a certain Emile D., driving a royal blue Mercedes with a young blonde in the passenger seat, ran over and killed an Australian camper trying to hitch a lift between Parentis and Mimizan, or again during a brawl in a Montpellier bar, a prostitute using the name of Vera slashed the face of a man called Lucien Campin, alias Monsieur Lulu, with broken bottle glass. That story appealed to me, especially because of the name Vera, which would have illuminated your daughter's personality in a quite disturbing way. But, unfortunately for me, Monsieur Lulu turned out to be in prison, and Vera alive and well and running a haberdashery at Palensac. As for the first story, that one also came up short. Emile D. had been arrested, convicted, and a, given a heavy fine in a three-month suspended prison sentence. The identity of his traveling companion had been kept out of the papers in order to avoid a scandal, as she was the lawful wife of a cabinet minister in office at the time. None of the cases I had to examine withstood these comp complimentary checks. I was on the verge of giving up the whole affair when one of the students I had hired pointed out that an event that we were hunting for could well have happened abroad. The prospect of having to go through the, whole, the lost pets of the whole planet did not exactly fill us with joy. <clears throat> but we buckled down to it nonetheless. If your daughter had fled to the States, I think I would have lost hope sooner, but this time, luck was with us. In the Exeter Express, an echo of the Monday of the 14th of June 1953, we read this heartbreaking story. 
Ewa Eriksson, the wife of a Swedish diplomat posted to London, was spending her holiday with her five-year-old son in a villa she had rented for a month at Stickelhaven in Devon. Her husband, Sven Eriksson, had had to stay behind in London for the coronation celebrations and was due to join her on Sunday the 13th of June after attending the great reception given on the evening of the 12th by the royal couple for more than 2,000 guests. Ewa's health was not strong, and before leaving London she had taken on an au pair of French origin whose task was to look after the child since a local charlatan would take care of cleaning and do the cooking. When Sven Eriksson arrived on the Sunday evening, he saw a horrible sight. His son, bloated like a kipper, was floating in the bath, and Ewa was lying on the bathroom tiles with her wrists slashed. They had died at least 48 hours earlier, that is to say on Friday evening. The facts were accounted for in this way. Told to bathe the little boy whilst Ewa took a rest, the au pair girl, intentionally or unintentionally, allows him to drown. Realizing the inexorable consequences of her act, she decides to run away immediately. A little later, Ewa discovers the child's corpse and, mad with grief, not knowing how to live on without her son, takes her own life. The absence of the charlotte who was due to come again on the Monday morning prevented these events from being discovered before Sven Eriksson's arrival and also gave the au pair girl 48 hours head start. Sven Eriksson had only ever seen the girl for a few minutes. Iwa had put small ads in various places, the YMCA, the Danish Cultural Center, the Lycée Français de Londres, the Goethe Institute, the Swiss Center, the Dante Alighieri Foundation, American Express, etc. And had taken on... <sighs> and had taken on the first girl to turn up. A young French woman, a young French woman of about 20, a student with nursing qualifications, tall, blonde, with pale eyes. She was called Véronique Lambert. Her passport had been stolen a month before, but she showed Madame Erickson a copy of the Declaration of Loss, made out by the French consulate. The Charlotte's statement contained little further detail. She clearly didn't like the way the French girl dressed and behaved, and had spoken as little as possible to her, but she was nonetheless able to state that she had a beauty spot beneath her right eyelid and there was a picture of a Chinese junk on her perfume bottle, and that she had a slight stutter. This description was circulated throughout Britain and France to no avail. I didn't find it difficult, Saline continued, to establish with certainty that Véronique Lambert was indeed Elizabeth de Beaumont, and that her murderer was Sven Eriksson, because when I went to Stickelhaven a fortnight ago, to try to find the charlatan so as to show her a photograph of your daughter, the first thing I learned was that Sven Eriksson, who, ever since the tragedy, had carried on renting the villa year in, year out, without ever using it, had returned there and taken his own life on the 17th of September preceding, only three days after the, after the double murder at chaumont Poissien. But if this suicide on the very side of the first tragedy proved the identity of Elizabeth's murderer beyond doubt, the main point still remained unclear. How had the Swedish diplomat succeeded in tracking down the girl who had caused the deaths of his wife and son six years before? I was vaguely hoping that he had left a letter to explain his act, but the police were adamant. There was no letter near the corpse, nor anywhere else. But my hunch had been correct. When I finally got to question Mrs. Weeds, the charlatan, I asked her if she had ever heard of Elizabeth de Beaumont, who had been murdered at chaumont Poussin. She rose and fetched a letter which she handed to me. Mr. Erickson, she said, told me that if anyone came one day to speak to me about the French girl and her dying in the Ardennes, I should give him this letter. And if I hadn't come, I was to wait and after six years send it to the address marked on it. Here is the letter, Cellini continued. It was intended for you. Your name and address are on the envelope. Motionless, stiff, and silent, Vera de Beaumont took the pages from Cellini's hand, unfolded them, and began to read. Exeter, the 16th of September, 1959. Madame, one day sooner or later, whether you find it by looking for it or having it looked for, or whether it reaches you by mail in six years' time, that's how long it has taken me to slake my vengeance. You will have this letter in your hands, and you will finally know why and how I killed your daughter. A little over six years ago, your daughter, who used the name of Veronique Lambert, was engaged as an au pair by my wife, who was not very well and wanted someone to, to take care of our son, Eric, who had just turned five. On Friday, the 11th of June, 1953, for reasons I still do not understand, Veronique, either on purpose or by accident, allowed our son to drown. Incapable of assuming her own responsibility for this criminal act, she fled, probably within the following 60 minutes. A little later, my wife discovered the corpse of our son, 
became insane, and slit her wrists with a pair of scissors. I was in London at that moment, and I did not see them until Sunday evening. I swore then to devote my life, my fortune, and my mind to taking my revenge. I had only seen her daughter for a few seconds when she arrived at Paddington to catch the train with my wife and our son, and when I learned that the name she was using was fake, I despaired of ever tracking her down. During the debilitating sleepless nights which began to afflict me then and have never left me in peace since, I recalled two anodyne details that my wife had told me when mentioning the interview she had with your daughter before giving her the job. My wife, learning the girl was French, spoke of Arles en Avignon, where we had stayed several times, and your daughter said she had been brought up in that area. And when my, my wife complimented her on her English, she said she had already spent two years in Britain and was studying archaeology. Mrs. Weeds, the charlatan who worked in the house with my wife, and who will be the guardian of this last letter until it reaches your hands, was of even greater help to me. It was she who had told me your daughter had a beauty spot beneath her right eyelid, that she used a perfume called Saint-Pang, and she stuttered. It was with her, too, that I searched the villa from top to bottom, looking for any clues that the false Veronique Lambert might have left. To my discomfiture, she had not stolen any jewels or things, but only the kitchen purse my wife had gotten ready for Mrs. Wheats to do the shopping, containing three pounds, eleven shillings, and seven pence. On the other hand, she hadn't been able to take all of her own things that she had left, in particular the linen of hers that was in the wash that week, various cheap underclothes, two handkerchiefs, a rather loud print neckerchief, and especially a white blouse embroidered with the initials E.B. The blouse could have been borrowed or stolen, but I hung on to those initials as a possible clue. I also found various objects of hers scattered around the house, in particular in the lounge she had not dared go into before fleeing in case she woke my wife, who was sleeping in the room next to it. The first volume of Henry Troyat's serial novel, Le Semey et les Moissons, which had been published a few months earlier in France. The label re inside revealed that this copy came from Rolandi's bookshop, 20 Bernier Street, a bookshop specializing in lending out foreign books. I took the book back to Rolandi's. There I learned that Veronique Lambert had a borrower's ticket. She was a student at the Institute of Archaeology a branch of the British Museum, and lived in a bed and breakfast at 79 Keppel Street, just behind the museum. Breaking into her room was a waste of time. She had left when my wife took her on as an au pair. Neither the landlady nor the lodgers could tell me anything. I had more luck at the Institute of Archaeology. Not only was there a photograph in the registration file, but I was able to meet some of her classmates, and amongst them there was a boy whom she had gone out a couple of times with. He provided me with a key piece of information. A few months earlier, she, he had invited her to see... Dido and Aeneas at Covent Garden. I hate opera, she had told him, and added, it's not surprising my mother was a singer. I hired several private detective agencies to trace, in France or elsewhere, a young woman between the age of 20 and 30, tall, blonde, with pale eyes, a slight mark beneath her right eyelid, and a mild stammer. The information card also mentioned that she perhaps used Saint-Pain perfume, was perhaps using the name of Veronique Lambert, and that her real initials could be E.B., and that she grew up in the south of France, had stayed in England, spoke good English, had been a student, and was interested in archaeology, and lastly, that her mother was or had been a singer. This last clue was a decisive one, reference to the biographies and who's who and other specialist things of all women singers whose name began with B produced nothing, but when we checked all those who had a daughter between 12, 1912 and 1935, your name came up together with about 75 others. Vera Orlova, born at Rostov in 1900, married the French archaeologist Ferdinand de Beaumont in 1926. One daughter, Elizabeth Natasha Victorine Marie, born in 1929. Enquiries quickly revealed that Elizabeth had been brought up by her grandmother at Lendignon, Department of Garde, and had run away from you on the 3rd of March, 1945, at the age of 16. I then grasped that it was in order to evade your pursuit that she had concealed her true identity. But that also meant, alas, that the trail I had found stopped short, since neither you nor your mother-in-law, despite all the appeals you had put on the radio and in the papers, had any news of her for seven years. You were already in 1954, or we were already in 1954. It had taken nearly a year to find out whom I was going to kill. It took another three for me to find her. For those three years, and this is something I want you to know, I supported teams of detectives who worked shifts to watch you 24 hours a day and to shadow both of you whenever you went out in Paris and whenever Countess de Beaumont went out in Lendignon. 
in the ever less probable case that your daughter might try to see you again or take refuge with her grandmother. Their surveillance was completely useless, but I didn't want to leave out any stone unturned. But I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. Everything that had even the slightest chance of putting me on a trail was tried out systematically. That was why I financed a huge market survey on exotic perfumes in general, and Sampang perfume in particular, why I obtained the names of all the persons having borrowed one or more volumes of Les Semelles et les Moissons from a public library, why all plastic surgeons in France received a personal letter inquiring whether they had had occasion since 1953 to conduct an operation to excise a navis located under the right eyelid of a young woman aged about 25, why I went around all the speech pathologists and our elocu elocution teachers looking for a tall blonde who'd been cured of a mild stammer, and why, lastly, I set up several entirely bogus archaeological expeditions devised uniquely to allow me to recruit through classified advertisements of a young woman with excellent English for a North American field study carrying out archaeological excavations near Pyrenees. I put a lot of hope into this last trap, and bagged nothing. There were crowds of candidates each time, but Elizabeth didn't show up. By the end of 1956, I was still fumbling, and had spent more than three quarters of my fortune. I had sold all my securities, all my land, all my properties, all I had left was my collection of paintings and my wife's jewels. I began to dispose of them one by one so as to keep on paying the army of investigators I had marching on the steps of your daughter. The death of your mother-in-law, the Countess de Beaumont, had reawakened my hopes in early 1957, for I knew how attached your daughter was to her, but she came no more to the funeral at Lenignon than you did, and it was a complete waste of effort to have the cemetery watch for several weeks in case she was determined, as I imagined she might be, to put flowers on the grave. These successive failures became increasingly exasperating, but I would not give up. I could not admit that Elizabeth might be dead, as if I had become the only person competent to dispose of her life and death and I wanted to go on believing she was in France. I have found out in the end how she had managed to get out of England without leaving any record of embarkation on the 12th of June in 1953, the day after the crime she took a boat from Torquay to the Channel Islands. By erasing the first letter of her name on the declaration of loss of her passport, she had managed to register under the name of Veronique Lambert, and her embarkation card filed under A had eluded the search made by the harbor police. This belated discovery didn't get me any further, but it gave me a basis for my belief that she was still hiding in France. That year I began, I think, to lose my reason. I began to explain things to myself like this. I am looking for Elizabeth de Beaumont, that is to say, a tall, blonde, pale-eyed young woman with good English, brought up in the guard, etc. Now Elizabeth de Beaumont knows I am looking for her, thus she is hiding. And in this case, hiding means removing as many as she can of the distinguishing features I wish she knows I know her. Therefore, I should be looking not for a tall blonde, etc., Elizabeth, but for an anti-Elizabeth, and I started getting suspicious about short, swarthy women jabbering Spanish. On another occasion, I awoke covered in sweat. I just dreamt the obvious solution to my nightmare. Standing beside a huge blackboard covered in equations, a mathematician was concluding his demonstration in front of a turbulent audience that the celebrated Monte Carlo theorem was generalizable. That meant not just that a roulette player pacing, placing his stake on a random number had just as much chance of winning as a martingale player systematically doubling his stake on the same number on each loss in order to recoup eventually, but that I had as much if not more chance of finding Elizabeth by going to Rumpelmeyer's for tea next day at 16 hours 18 minutes precisely than by having 413 detectives looking for her. I was weak enough to give way to the dream. At 16 hours 18 minutes, I went into the tea shop. A tall redhead left as I entered. I had her followed, uselessly of course. Later on, I told my dream to one of my investigators who was working for me. He said quite seriously that I had only made a mistake of interpretation. The number of detectives should have made me suspicious. 413 was obviously the inverse of 314. That is to say, of the number pi, something would have happened at 18 hours, 60 minutes. So then I began to appeal to the exhausting resources of the irrational. If your mysterious and beautiful American neighbor still had, been, had still been there, you can be sure I would have had recourse to her disturbing services. Instead, I went in for turning tables. 
I wore rings encrusted with particular stones. I had magnets and hanged men's fingernails and tiny balls of herbs, seeds, and colored stones sewn into the hems of my clothes. I consulted wizards and water diviners, fortune tellers and crystal ball gazers and soothsayers of all sorts. They threw dice or burned a photograph of your daughter in a white porcelain plate and examined the ash. They rubbed their left arms with fresh verbana leaves put hyenas' gallstones under their tongues, spread flour on the floor, made unending anagrams of your daughter's name and pseudonyms, or replaced the letters of her name with figures in an attempt to reach 253, examined candle flames through vases filled with water, threw salt into fire, and listened to the crackling, or jasmine seed or laurel branches to watch the smoke, poured the, the white of an egg laid by a black hen into a cup of water, or dropped in lead or molten wax and watched the shapes that were made, they had sheep's shoulder blades, grilled on hot coals, hung sieves on wild wire and rotated them, examined carp rows, asses' brains, and circles of grain pecked by a rooster. On the 11th of July in 1957, there was a coup de théâtre. One of the men stationed at Lénignon to continue the watch, despite the death of Comte de Saint-Beaumont, rang me to say that Elizabeth had written to the town hall to request a copy of her birth certificate. She had given a hotel address in Orange. Logic, if in these circumstances one may still talk of logic, demanded I should grasp this opportunity to end this inextricable affair. All I needed to do was to take from its green leather sheath the weapon which, some three years earlier, I had decided would be the instrument of my revenge, a bone-handled field surgeon's scalpel similar in appearance to a razor but infinitely sharper which I had learned to handle with unrivaled dexterity, and to burst in at orange. But instead, I heard myself ordering my men simply to tail your daughter and not to relax their surveillance. They missed her at orange in any case. The hotel didn't exist. She had gone to the post office saying she had made a mistake and the postman dealing with mail, returned to sender, had fished out the letter from the Lenignon town and handed it to her. But they caught up with her a few weeks later at Valence. That is where she got married, with two of Francois Bradel's workmates acting as witnesses. She left Valence the same evening with her husband. They had certainly guessed that they were being followed, and for more than a year they tried to evade me. They did everything they could, laying all sorts of false trails, decoys, and simulations, dropping misleading clues, holding up in sordid lodging houses, and accepting squalid jobs in order to survive. Night porterage, bottle washing, grape picking, cesspit cleaning. But week by week, the four detectives whose services I could still afford to use tightened the net. More than 20 times I had the opportunity of killing her daughter with impunity. But each time, on one pretext or another, I let the opportunity slip. It was as if my long pursuit had led me to forget the oath in the name of which I had undertaken it. The easier it became to assuage my vengeance, the more I drew back from doing so. On the 8th of August in 1958, I received a letter from your daughter. Sir, I have always known you would use every effort to find me. At the moment your son died, I knew it would be no use begging you or your wife for a gesture of mercy or pity. News of your wife's suicide reached me a few days later and convinced me you would spend the rest of your life hunting me down. What was to begin with only an intuition and an apprehension was confirmed over the following months. I was aware you knew almost nothing about me, but I was sure you would use every available means to exploit to the full the meager details you possessed. On the day when in a street in Cholet, a researcher offered me a sample of the perfume I'd used that year in England, I guessed instinctively that it was a trap. A few months later, a small ad asking for a young woman with good English to accompany a team of archaeologists told me, you knew more about me than I thought. From then on, my life became a long nightmare. I felt I was being watched by everybody, everywhere, always. I began to suspect everybody. Waiters who spoke to me, checkout girls who gave me change, customers of the butchers who shouted at me for not waiting my turn. I was being followed, tracked down, observed by taxi drivers, policemen, pseudo-drunks, slumped on park benches, chestnut sellers, lottery ticket sellers, newsboys. One night at the end of my tether in the waiting room at Breve Station, I began to hit a man who was staring at me. I was arrested and taken to the police station, and but for a quasi-miracle, I would have been sectioned in a psychiatric ward. A young couple who had witnessed the scene offered to take charge of me. They lived in the Cévent, in a deserted village whose ruined houses they were rebuilding. I lived there for nearly two years. We were alone, three humans, a score of goats and chickens. We had no newspapers and no radio. With time, my fears evaporated. I would convince myself you had given up or died. 
In June 1957, I returned to live among men. Shortly after, I met Francois. When he asked me to marry him, I told him my whole story, and he had little difficulty persuading me that my sense of guilt had made me imagine that incessant surveillance. I regained my confidence bit by bit, sufficiently to risk asking the town hall for a copy of my birth certificate, since I needed it to get married. It was, I guess, one of the mistakes which you and your lair had been waiting for me to make. Since then, we have lived continually on the run. For a year, I believed I could get away from you. I know now that I cannot. You will always have luck and money on your side. It is pointless believing I will ever succeed in getting through the holes in the net you have cast, just as it is illusory to hope that you will ever cease to pursue me. You have the power to kill me, and you believe you have the right to do so, but you won't make me run any further. Together with my husband, Francois, and Anne, to whom I have just given birth, I shall live from now on without shifting in Chaumont Possien in the Ardennes. I await you with serenity. For more than a year, I made myself give no sign of life. I sacked all the detectives and investigators I had hired. I closeted myself in my flat, hardly went out, lived on ginger crackers and tea bags using alcohol, tobacco, and maxitone tablets to maintain myself in a sort of pulsating fever, which gave way at times to bouts of complete torpor. The certain knowledge that Elizabeth was waiting for me, went to bed each night thinking she might never awake, kissed her daughter each morning, almost surprised to be still alive. The feeling that this reprieve was for her a new torture every day was sometimes like being inebriated with revenge, a sensation of evil, omnipotent, ubiquitous exaltation, and sometimes it threw me into a boundless depression. For weeks on end, day and night, unable to sleep for more than a few minutes at a stretch, I paced the corridors and the rooms of my flat, chortling or sobbing, seeing myself suddenly in front of her, rolling on the floor and begging her pardon. Last Friday, on the 11th of September, Elizabeth got her second letter to me. Sir, I am writing from the Rochetel Maternity Clinic, where I have just delivered my second daughter, Beatrice. Anne, my first, has just had her first birthday. Come, I beg you. It's now or never that you must come. I killed her two days later. In killing her, I understood that death delivered her just as the day after tomorrow it will deliver me. The meager remnants of my fortune deposited with my lawyers will be shared in accordance with my last instructions between your two granddaughters when they come of age. Madame de Beaumont, even if she had been overcome on learning of her daughter's death, read without a shiver to the end of this story. By whose sadness she seemed no more touched than she had been some twenty-five years before by her husband's suicide. This apparent indifference to death is perhaps explained by her own history. One morning in April 1918, when the Orlov family, scattered to the four corners of Holy Russia by the Revolution, had miraculously succeeded in uniting almost intact a, de a detachment of Red Guards took their villa by storm. Vera saw her grandfather, old Sergei Ilya Aronovich Orlov, whom Alexander III had appointed minister plenipotentiary to Persia, her father, Colonel Orlov, the officer commanding the famous battalion of Krasnodar Lancers and nicknamed the Butcher of Kuban by Trotsky, and her five brothers, the youngest only just eleven years old, shot dead before her eyes. She and her mother managed to escape, protected by a thick fog that lasted three days. After a nightmare of seventy-nine days forced march, they got at last to Crimea, then occupied by Denikin's commandos, and thence via Romania to Austria. So, here we are, back where we're all going to end up in the same kind of situation, a space that belongs to everybody and nobody. Yeah. Always remember, life is too short to read bullshit. Looks like this person remembered that. Yeah, that'll do. Okay. 
Have a good day, guys. Talk to you soon. Ciao. Spotted the other day. Staring at me, now it's staring at you.